Following President Trump's historic meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin, a new ceasefire deal has emerged in southwest Syria. The agreement is set to go into effect on Sunday and takes the U.S. involvement in Syria's civil war to a new level. Jordan and Israel are also part of the agreement, both of which share a border with southern Syria. The deal isn't part of the de-escalation zones which were planned earlier this year by Russia, Turkey and Iran and which failed to materialize after peace talks in Kazakhstan fell apart. It's a significant step forward for Russia and the U.S., which have backed opposing sides in the conflict. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson said that if the deal holds, it could serve as a blueprint for other parts of the country. But Britain isn't putting the horse before the cart. The recent history of the Syrian civil war is littered with ceasefires. And it would be nice, you know, one day to have a ceasefire. Uh, none of these have turned out to be ceasefires. Uh, they've been uh, broken uh, persistently and broken by, by the regime and indeed broken by Russian activity itself. So, you know, we welcome any ceasefire, but uh, let's see it. Let's see the results uh, on the ground. Where these uh, safety zones are proposed, you know, let's not uh, have the civilian population misled. If they can be properly enforced, then they are thoroughly welcome. We can then get in the United Nations humanitarian aid that uh, was promised. However, in a step backwards for Syria, Tillerson also announced Friday that President Bashar al-Assad must not remain in power. Tillerson spoke following the meeting between Presidents Trump and Putin, saying it's not clear how Assad will leave, but there will be a transition away from the Assad family. He added that he believes the U.S. and Russia share a vision of a stable Syria when the ISIS conflict is resolved. His comments contrast to reports on Thursday that Washington was working up a new strategy that could leave the Syrian leader in power. The deal would open cooperation with Moscow and might even allow for Russian troops to patrol conflict zones around the country. That supposed deal is still under wraps and details may emerge following the meeting between Trump and Putin. But while the politicians debate, Syrians are still suffering. U.S.-backed forces from the SDF are breaking through terrorist lines in Raqqa. The coalition fighters are closing in from both sides of the city, and reports say they're less than three miles apart. But that's small consolation for the Syrians trapped in the city, many of whom say the rebels are as bad as the ISIS terrorists they're fighting. We left because of the fighting. We were afraid. We have children. We almost died of hunger, and no one helped us. We escaped the war between the Islamic State and the Syrian Democratic Forces. We escaped because we were at a battlefield. We were brought here to this camp, and our homes are over there two miles away, and we've been banned from entering them. Our belongings have been stolen. We've left our lands, and we couldn't take anything. We spend all our time just trying to get permission to slip back into our own homes. U.S. officials say despite the successes, it could still be weeks or even months before the city is fully liberated. So far, about 20% of Raqqa has been recaptured, though fierce resistance from ISIS fighters is slowing things down. But the fighting isn't keeping people from returning to their country. The UN reports over half a million Syrians who were displaced by the conflict have returned to their homes. A spokesman for the UN says this is a significant return, but is just a fraction of the some 5 million who fled from the war. Yet it's still a positive trend, and UN envoy to Syria, Staffan de Mistura, says there's an overall decline in violence in Syria. It would appear that despite Assad's betrayal as a brutal dictator, people living under his rule are still eager to return. The progress in the city comes before a backdrop of renewed activity from the United Nations, which is pushing for an investigation into April's chemical weapons attack in Han Shehun. We can have differences of opinions, we can handle that. But, for example, when on the subject of use of chemical weapons, we are both firmly opposed to it. And the challenge now is to completely dismantle the stock of the Syrian regime's chemical weapons. The condemnation comes despite any evidence the Syrian government was involved in the attack and contradicts the UN's previous findings that Syria has already turned over all its chemical weapons. The Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, or OPCW, issued a report on June 30th claiming sarin gas was used in the attack. However, senior Syrian officials say the OPCW is refusing to visit key sites linked to the bombing, raising doubts about the organization's credibility. A representative for the group says the report is inconclusive and full of gaps and lacks evidence to support its findings. But that hasn't stopped officials in Washington from blaming the Syrian government and claiming it was preparing for renewed attacks.
You know, this recent statement from the White House alleging that the Syrian government was planning an upcoming chemical attack, uh, are you concerned that that could have created an opening for terrorist groups to carry out a chemical attack? No. <laughs> You're not concerned, even though al-Nusra, al-Qaeda groups have been using chemical weapons in Syria? That's documented? No. Uh, next question um, on Syria. Well, I mean, they could carry out a chemical attack, and then with the White House saying, oh, Assad was going to do it, that, that would create a cover for them to do such a thing. Do I have to do this again? We know that Assad has used chemical weapons on his own people, and he's done that repeatedly. Well, hasn't including, the United States convinced in, the world that... that, that including women and children, and we have all seen that. We have all seen the video, and there is uh, no debate about that. Okay. So I'm, I'm didn't gonna... Assad give up his chemical weapons in 2013? <laughs> didn't no. that happen? No. That didn't uh, happen, heavy, so the, the heavy, let's, let's go over to you. Him. Anything else, on Sarah? Yeah. I said before, are you saying that al-Qaeda has not used chemical weapons? I, I'm not going to get into this conversation with you well, about this. this because, no, no, no. You want to have a debate, okay, about a hypothetical Okay, and I'm not going to get if into you a debate. That there's I, a pending chemical I'm not attack, going to get into a debate about a hypothetical. But what the that, then they could carry out an attack, and it would look like the government did it. I mean, isn't isn't that a real if you want to try to make excuses for the Assad regime? Go I'm right ahead. About You've Assad. got a I'm lot of cameras on you right groups. now. I'm talking about Al Qaeda. Okay, and, and I'm not going to spend all our folks' time having that conversation. We all know here in this room that Bashar al-Assad is responsible for chemical attacks on his own people, including women and, and children. An we are not also, going to debate it beyond, beyond that. Al-Qaeda, horrible too. Uses but what we're talking weapons. about right now is Assad and uh, Syria. Well, okay. I asked you about Al-Qaeda. Next, next question. Was... The alleged chemical attack in April killed 89 people. While the U.S. maintains its goal is to protect the Syrian people, U.S.-led airstrikes in Syria have killed at least 224 civilians since June, two and a half times more people than were killed in Han Shehun. Pearson Sharp, One American News.